with you. It's good to be with you this morning. Glad you could uh, get here on the, you know, the roads are a little dicey in places, but uh, just thank, thank God that uh, we all got here safely. Uh, just a few worship notes for this morning. Uh, during Advent, if you look at the liturgy, it says that uh, the Gloria in Excelsis is not to be sung during Advent. Hallelujahs are fine. That's for Lent. You know, we don't sing Hallelujah during Lent, but this is Advent. So the only thing we, we don't do uh, traditionally uh, during Advent is that we uh, don't sing the uh, Glory be to God on high on earth, peace, good will, and all that. And, and the reason for that basically is similar to, to why we don't sing Hallelujahs during Lent is that you. It's like fasting. You, know, you, you just simply omit it. Say, we're not going to do that. So that when Christmas Eve comes and Christmas Day, then, then you sing it out. You sing, the, you sing the song that the angels sang on that first Christmas night. Glory to God in the highest. You know, it just, it's, just, it's just beautiful. You know, it's just, ah, oh, yes, we get it back again. It's fun. It's wonderful. It's, it's glorious. So anyway, so much for that. And then the other thing that we're going to do, uh, worship notes, so that uh, you know what's happening, is that you know when, when we do the intro it, which is like an entrance prayer, uh, usually it's a psalm, part of a psalm, instead of singing uh, glory be to the Father and so on and so forth, uh, we're just going to substitute the what's in your bulletin. It's in the insert. It has the O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, one verse of that. And that's what we'll sing in place of, of the uh, of the uh, what's called in Latin the Gloria Patri, right? Uh, so anyway, that's that's the worship notes, and then the last hymn. Instead of following the melody, now it's using the words that are there. But we're going to be using a, a different melody. So just so you've got a heads up on that. But the, it'll work. It'll work just fine. Okay? So that's the last hymn. That was the last hymn so, that we're talking about for that. So those are all my worship notes. Uh, the, the sermon today is going to be kind of a takeoff on Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So that's what the sermon is. is based on that. So I'll just give you a little heads up about that. I, I think that's about it. Uh, let's uh, begin our worship now as we sing our opening hymn on Jordan Spank the Baptist by 344.
beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with true hearts and confess our sins to God our Father, imploring him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and the rest you deserve your general and eternal punishment. But I have heart and sorrow for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you for the promise of mercy, and for the sake of the holy and innocent set of sufferings and death, your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, the poor sinful me. On this, your confession, I, by virtue of Jesus Christ, who said, whatever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whatever sins you retain, they are retained. He said that on the day of his resurrection from the dead. On that day, God accepted his sacrifice for the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The intro is printed in our insert, and we will speak it responsibly. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Give ear, O Shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the territory, shine forth. You brought a mine out of Egypt. Give us a and fill the land. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it will be forever. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Uh, this was the uh, 
And the article that we're reading from, let me just uh, get, get my bearings here a little bit so we know what we're reading. So the article is, uh, got to read my Roman numerals here, is uh, article number 27. And the title of the article <coughs> is uh, Monastic Vows. You might recall from your uh, history that uh, when Luther was struck by lightning, he said, St. Anne, I'll become a monk. He prayed to St. Anne because he was a good Roman Catholic kid, you know, grew up and he was young, and death was bothering him and his sin. And he said, St. Anne, I promise I'll become a monk, and he went to the monastery. So this is about monastic vows, and, uh, uh, and what the Lutherans confessed back in 1530 about that. And we're picking it up at paragraph 30 here. And we'll read through uh, the end of paragraph 39. Therefore, it is not fair to insist so rigorously on the obligation. Everyone knows that taking a vow that is not made freely and deliberately is against the very nature of a true vow. Most canonical laws overturn vows made before the age of 15. Uh, before that age, a person does not seem able to make a wise judgment and to decide to make a lifelong commitment like this. <clears throat> I suppose in those days uh, there were young, young people younger than 15 who made vows to enter the uh, convent to become a nun or enter the priesthood when they were just, just children. I, I'm guessing that this is what is being addressed here, saying that those vows should not be considered binding when a child makes these decisions. There is another canon law that uh, adds even more years to this limit, showing that the vow of chastity should not be made before the age of 18. So which of these two canon laws should we follow? Most people leaving the monastery have a valid excuse since they took their vows before they were 15 or 18. Finally, even though it might be possible to condemn a person who breaks a vow, it does not follow that it is right to dissolve such a person's marriage. Augustine denies that they ought to be dissolved, and it gives the, the place and quote uh, where that was written by uh, Augustine. Augustine, uh, uh, Augustine's, Augustine's authority should not be taken lightly, even though some wish to do so today. Although it appears that God's command about marriage delivers many from their vows, our teachers introduce another argument about vows to show that they are void. Every service of God established and chosen by people to merit justification and grace without God's commandment is wicked. For Christ says in Matthew 15, verse 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Paul, teach, Paul teaches everywhere that righteousness is not to be sought in self-chosen practices and acts of worship devised by people. Righteousness comes by faith to those who believe that they are received by God into grace for Christ's sake. It is clear for all to see that the monks have taught that services made up by people make satisfaction for sins and merit grace and justification. What else is this than this detracting from Christ's glory and hiding and denying the righteousness that comes through faith? Therefore, it follows that monastic vows which have been widely taken are wicked services of God and consequently are void. For a wicked vow 
taken against God's commandment is not valid. For, as the canon says, no vow ought to bind people to wickedness. Pretty strong language by the reformers, you know, to say that, and, and their main concern, their main concern, as you heard, just heard, is that when you make human works the, the important thing, human behavior, human conduct, and you make that the primary thing, you rob Christ of, of the credit and the glory that he should get for forgiving our sins on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. So that's their main concern, is robbing Christ of his glory. And no, we're, we're not supposed to, we're not, we, we're not to do that. So. Very good, good words from the Confessions. Uh, we now continue with uh, the readings of Holy Scripture. The uh, sermon text for today is based on uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Beautiful words from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is, has been called the evangelist of the Old Testament. Wonderful good news from Isaiah. He said, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with him. This is the word of the Lord. Our next uh, reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people 
want you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. This is the word of the Lord. There to hear the words of the Holy Gospel, the same one of the verse. Church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of saints. 
through Jesus Christ, our coming King. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens tells the story of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, a uh, wretched old miser who makes life miserable for his overworked, underpaid, money counter, gentle Bob Cratchit. And one day in particular, Bob Cratchit gets a full dose of Scrooge's cruelty, for it is Christmas Eve. The beggar children are out caroling, the businessmen's Christmas aid fund, the freewheeling Christmas cheer, the whole holiday gaiety galls Scrooge. Late that same night, he tucks himself in bed and Ebenezer receives a most unwelcome visit. A dreadful ghost dragging chains, terrible chains, bursts into the miser's bedroom. It is the ghost of Jacob Marley, Scrooge's former business partner, who had died seven years ago that very night. The specter cries, I am doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me, and witness what I cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. You are fettered, says Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replies the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembles more and more. Or would you know, pursues the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full and heavy and long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. Yours is a ponderous chain. Jacob, Scrooge implores. Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the phantom replies. Comfort comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. What did, uh, what did Isaiah say in our Old Testament lesson? You repeat after me what he said. Comfort. Comfort. Comfort my people. Comfort my people. Says, your Says your God. Speak tenderly. Speak tenderly. Yeah. Kind of the opposite of the ghost, right? The ghost would not speak any comfort. But Isaiah speaks comfort. And who has who has hungered for comfort? Uh, haven't we all at times, uh, whether it's personal struggles or just some bad news that you that, that comes your way or some tragedy or whatever, you know, oh, we need some comfort, Lord. We need some help here. And and it's, and particularly, you know, we're, we're always reminded this time of year, the media always makes this point that more people get depressed at Christmas time than any other time of the year. We're always reminded of that. That's been going on for decades, you know. And uh, and why is that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that smart. But it could be that we're haunted by ghosts, so to speak, uh, in the sense that, you know, we think about the Christmases of the past. Uh, we may miss certain things about what it used to be like uh, years ago. And I notice that the older we get, uh, I'm only 70, so I'm still a young guy, right? Uh, but, you know, that, that you, you do think about, hmm, 
It was a little simpler time, I think, back in the 50s and 60s, as I think about it. Or it could be Christmas present. Maybe there's something, as I just said, something going on right now, some crisis in your life, or in someone else's life that you know and that you care about, some loved one, and they're going through a rough time. I know of one family where uh, the daughter, she's only 21, it's, for, it's from members of the church that I retired from five years ago, but they're concerned about her because she's, she's using fentanyl. And that's, that's serious. I mean, that's very serious. And, and she, she's, she knows she needs treatment, and she's being encouraged to get treatment, but uh, as, of, as of this moment, as far as I know, she's been resisting that. So, tough times, you know, tough, tough situations. And then there's the Christmases yet to come, um, worried about what the future might bring. So, with, uh, with Scrooge, um, I won't go through all the details of the story, but he has the, the ghost of Christmas past, he sees some things that what he acted like when he was young, and that discourages him. Next comes the Christmas present, and um, he gets a, a vision of, uh, of uh, Tiny Tim might die because of poverty and, wit and uh, illness, and, and so on and so forth. And, and so we might ask the question, have, have any of us I, I, I want to include myself in this because, you know, when a preacher preaches a sermon, he's supposed to preach it first to himself before he preaches it to others. So I want to say us. Have, have any of us hoarded any of our many blessings? And then finally comes the, uh, the, the ghost of a Christmas future, and, and uh, he sees the tombstone with his name on it, and, and he asks uh, something to the effect is, what are my prospects? Is this what must be? Is it, is it possible to make a change? And of course, the emphasis with the Christmas carol, though, is uh, again a little misguided because it points to our change, our behavior, our conduct, that that's the thing that matters most. And the problem with that is it will never be good enough. I mean, yes, reformation of life is important, and it is, and sanctification is important, and we should live a new Christian life, and yes, we should bear the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control, yes, but none of us will do that with perfection. So the reason why Jesus said, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, was not so that we can strive to reach perfection, because it's impossible. None of us can obey God's law perfectly. None of us can, uh, well, you know, the Bible says if you hate someone, you're a murderer. So we're no better than King David, who actually did commit murder and adultery. Anyone who looks lustfully has committed adultery. We're all lost. The law never, never gives us the way to comfort. That's not where it's at. Because Isaiah made it clear. He said, we're all like grass and we're all going to waste away. We all age, and we all die weak, and, and we fail, and, and whatever. I mean, we, we know that. And we've seen it with all of our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. They all wasted away. And so, what's the comfort then? The comfort is, ah, the good news. He'll give double pardon, double, double for all our sins. In Jesus Christ, that's the good news. And uh, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly. And that's what I'm here for, uh, you know, to speak those words of comfort uh, tenderly to you. And uh, what, what are those great words? What are, where, where do we find the words of tender comfort from Isaiah? Yes, it's in chapter 40, yes, but it's even better in chapter 53. That's where it really reaches the, uh, the, the peak, you know, the best of the best of the words of... There is no place in the Bible, in the Old Testament anyway, that's as beautiful and as comforting and as tender 
as the words of Isaiah 53, where it says, Surely he has borne, why don't you say what he said? Go ahead, you repeat after me. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's, folks, I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than that. There, there's nothing I could say from this pulpit that can improve on that. Um, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And so today, you know, here we are in Dorset at, at uh, First English Church, you know, and on the, first, on the second Sunday of Advent, December 10th, uh, uh, getting towards the end of 2023. And, um, you know, ghosts, right? We've been talking a little bit about ghosts. And isn't it interesting that Jesus brought up on the day of his resurrection uh, the issue of ghosts? <laughs> he, said, he said to the disciples, he said, a ghost doesn't have flesh and blood like you see that I have. He says, you have anything here to eat? You know, he, that's what he said. And, and, uh, and, and as far as Thomas was concerned, he thought, oh yeah, you, you disciples, all you did was see a ghost. You know, you just saw a ghost. It wasn't, it wasn't really Jesus risen from the dead. But when Thomas was invited by Jesus and said, put your finger there, put your finger in my side where the spear went in, and see my hands and my feet. And what did Thomas say? Remember what he said? My... Lord, remember? Yeah, you remember. You know this stuff. Hey, you've been going to church longer than I have, some of you, right? He said, my Lord and my God, right? And there it is. You know, there's, there's the good news, you know, and uh, the good news of Christ. And I hope you've heard that comfort today. And it's always good when you get to the end of a sermon to ask the question, well, what difference does this make in our lives? You know, we've heard a little bit of the comfort of Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, by his blood shed on Good Friday, by his resurrection on Easter Sunday, we heard this Advent comfort. So, so what? What, what difference does it make? I heard a, a, from a relative of mine who uh, is a struggling quite a bit. And she went to a neighbor across the street who is a Christian. At least she, she professes to be a Christian. And this particular relative of mine said, Will you please pray for me? I'm having a difficult time. And this Christian neighbor replied unsympathetically, unsympath that's unsympathetically, go pray yourself. Now granted, I don't know all the circumstances. And, and perhaps her neighbor may have been justified in saying that because I don't know all, all of the situation. But let me say this. You may have someone in your family, a member, family member, or you may know of a co-worker, or you may have a classmate if you're in school who happens to be struggling right now. And since you've heard a little bit of God's comfort today from God's word, from Isaiah, I just urge you to share some of God's comfort with them as best as you can. Uh, don't worry about getting all the words right. Just say, well, even if it's just, even if it's as simple as just saying, I'll pray for you, or how can I pray for you? That's all you have to say. How would you like me to pray for you? And if you do that by God's grace and follow through with a little bit of comfort, then you could say with Tiny Tim, God bless us, everyone, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The uh, offertory will now take place. Uh, <laughs>
Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. As you led Joseph like a flock, so now by your Son, lead us into straight paths. Bring us out of bondage of our sins and plant us securely in your eternal promises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you sent John the Baptist to herald the coming Messiah and proclaim a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In these latter days, you send pastors to proclaim the same repentance for the forgiveness of sins and through them lead your people to trust in your salvation. Look with kindness upon all pastors that they may be diligent and faithful heralds and messengers of your beloved Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear God of all comfort, your word alone endures forever. The nations of the world and their empires come and go before you. Even kings and rulers are like brass before your breath. Preserve us from placing our trust in princes and mortal men. Give us rulers who will rule after your good pleasure, keeping order and protecting life, that we may live peaceably in godly quietness and honesty, especially that our lawmakers would preserve the life of the unborn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give ear, O Shepherd of Israel, to our prayers, especially those on our prayer list, those who are sick and ill, those awaiting surgery or recovering from the same. Give them your mercy and your healing, courage and perseverance to all who cry to you. May they find comfort in your enduring word and your certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life with Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we know that you are not slow in keeping your promises to return. We thank you for your patience. Do not take your spirit from us when we stray from your commandments, but convict us of our sin and draw us back to you in heartfelt, sincere repentance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you invite us again to your table to receive the medicine of immortality in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. May we receive this sacrament of the altar rightly, that with faith strengthened and sins forgiven, our lives may be lived in holiness and godliness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we in the church on earth wait for the coming of your Son, we remember all the saints who have gone before us and now rest in your presence. Keep us safe in your arms until you gather your people together in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, in which righteousness dwells. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And all these and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. truly meet right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you heavenly father especially at this time as we remember john the baptist who heralded and cried out prepare the way of the lord therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we lord and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying,
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.